So our next speaker is Steve Friesen. Whenever you're ready. There we go, that's fine. Uh, thank you very much uh, for having me here today, and I must say it's a pleasure to be here 100 years after Buffalo Bill died in Denver and requested to be buried on Lookout Mountain. <laughs> I had to say that, I had to say that. <laughs> and that particular discussion can continue at the Irma Bar later today, but anyway. I'm going to be kind of segueing a little bit more in, into some specific aspects of Buffalo Bill's legacy. We were raised on horseback. That is the way we had to work. These men furnished us the same work we were raised to. That is the reason we want to work for these kinds of men. This was Blackheart's response in 1890 when grilled by the Department of Interior about his participation in Buffalo Bill's Wild West. Later, after his first season of the Wild West in 1902 and 1903, Luther Standing Bear return for the next season. He was to meet show representatives at Rushville, Nebraska. He wrote that, when I arrived there, I was surprised to see all the Indians from my reservation there waiting. They had a big camp. It seems they had found out in some manner that I was again to be in charge. And when I entered the, the camp, I was besieged on all sides from those who wanted to go out with the show. For the Lakota, a chance to travel with Buffalo Bill's Wild West was an unprecedented opportunity, a chance to get away from the nasty and brutish life on the reservation, a chance for them, a nomadic people, a formerly nomadic people, to travel the world, and most importantly, a chance to reenact a life and culture that was being suppressed by the United States government. For the Europeans, a visit from Buffalo Bill's Wild West was a chance to see something they had only read about in the newspapers or seen in artwork, the American West. And the Lakota were the most fascinating aspect of the West to them. For members of Buffalo Bill's Wild West, as well as the people of Europe, the show's trips to Europe were a time to experience something exotic and unusual. Strange cultures were encountered on both counts. It was an enjoyable experience for both sides. Luther Standing Bear noted that in 1902, after the conclusion of the show, British visitors to Buffalo Bill's Wild West then went to the Indian village where they had a chance to see how we lived. He also wrote about his visit to London. I was sorry to leave this city because I had been given a chance to see many wonderful sights and view many interesting places. In the midst of this exchange, something special happened. The cultures became familiar. Sam Lone Bear learned French and German. Jenny Lapointe, a single Lakota woman, traveled comfortably across Europe. The Munich Cowboy Club was formed in 1913 so Germans could reenact and remember the Wild West. When Edward Tutu, a Lakota performer, died in Germany, he asked to be buried near Dresden. Today, Hartmut Reichel and other Indian enthusiasts maintain the grave to which Lakota visitors often make pilgrimages, placing rocks, as you can see, from Pine Ridge upon Tutu's gravestone. When Buffalo Bill's Wild West traveled to Europe for the first time in 1887, it began an era of Wild West performance in the United Kingdom and on the continent that continued until World War II. Critical to that performance were the Lakota, who were the largest contingent, contingent of performers in Buffalo Bill's Wild West. Buffalo Bill himself frequently stated that they were the most important part of his show and he paid them well for that role. They would continue to be important to all subsequent Wild West shows that visited Europe. During the early part of the 20th century, the nature of the venues within which the Lakota appeared uh, changed. The popularity of the Wild West shows had been replaced to some degree by circuses and world's fairs, and they all started including Wild West components. They always included in and performances, most frequently performances by the Lakota. There were even the Volkerschau, uh, people shows, at zoos like Carl Hagenbeck's zoo near Hamburg. There was the Jardin d'Acclimatation in Paris, which offered exhibits 
of native peoples from around the world. Now, as distasteful as that concept might be to us today, even the Volcker Shell provided an opportunity for cultural exchange and cultural understanding. The nature of the performance over time changed as well. Exhibitions of battles became less important, and there were greater, it was a greater emphasis on Lakota culture. The era of Lakota performance in Europe lasted nearly 50 years. While it changed throughout that period in terms of venues, types of performance, and even costuming, the one constant was the impact of Buffalo Bill and his Wild West. That show set the standard for European understanding of the American West, creating stereotypes and establishing sympathy for the Lakota that has continued until today. Just as importantly, it provided Lakota with an ongoing opportunity pr to preserve and present their culture during a time when the forces of the United States government and even the well-meaning but paternalistic reformers were trying to destroy it. A Lakota who joined a show was referred to as, as Oskate Wichasa, one who performs. Those who perform were paid well. They were able to travel around the United States and the world. They were able to wear the clothing, sing the songs, dance the dances that were forbidden on the reservation. This is Jerome, a little elk incidentally, he was an Oshkate Wichasa uh, with Buffalo Bill's Wild West. He not only performed but also acted as a policeman with Buffalo Bill's Wild West. While discipline among the rest of the personnel was maintained by management, the Wild West created Corps of Indian Police to specifically oversee the Indian performers. Not only was this a way of accounting for significant language and cultural differences, but it was also another way to placate the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the reformers. The police were chosen from the ranks of the Indian performers by the performers themselves. John Burke, manager for the Wild West, stated, for every dozen Indian performers, there is an Indian policeman. He wears a badge and he is paid $10 a month more than the rest. This policeman is elected by the 12 and he can be deposed by them at any time. The head of the Indian police was usually uh, appointed by Buffalo Bill and was accountable to him. Luther Standing Bear, who we see here and I mentioned earlier, was appointed by Buffalo Bill as head of the chief of police while he or was the head of the police while he was there. Standing Bear was later elected a chief of Lakota and used his experiences in the Wild West to travel to the United States advocating for his people's rights. The government's efforts were largely influenced by the 19th century reformers who felt that the U.S. had only two alternatives. Either the Indians would be wiped out by the forward march of civilization or they would need to become civilized. Carl Schurz, a former Secretary of the Interior put it bluntly in 1881 when he voiced the Indians two options, extermination or civilization. Now while the, the reformers rejected extermination as an inhumane, ex unacceptable alternative, they felt that the Indians' way of life and culture not only would but should end. When some had said during the Indian Wars that the only good Indian was a dead Indian, now they started saying, kill the Indian, save the man. This was in, uh, utilized by Richard Pratt at the Carlisle Indian School when he started it and in other schools throughout. This, incidentally, is the government school at Pine Ridge. The idea of these Indian schools was to re remove the Indian children from their culture, including their families, and the quote unquote bad influence of their way of life. In this context, they could then become civilized. The paternalistic and so-called civilizing approach of the reformers was in direct opposition to the efforts of people like Buffalo Bill. Buffalo Bill and other Wild West organizers felt the Indian's culture was interesting, unique, and therefore should be shown off. They took full advantage of the fact that the West was changing, as were all of its people, not just the Indians. Buffalo Bill's Wild West even drew parallels between the ways of the West and the dinosaurs in their advertising, pointing out you would not miss a dancing dinosaur or a saber-toothed tiger then don't miss Buffalo Bill's Wild West. Buffalo Bill felt this applied not only to the Indians, but to all the peoples of the West in general. He repeatedly emphasized that he was not producing just a show, but was providing an educational exhibition. And for this reason, and even he and his partners rejected the term show 
in relation to the Wild West. Um, in doing this, they encourage the Vaqueros, the Indians, and other ethnic groups to value and preserve their ways of life. Commissioner Thomas Jefferson Morgan, however, wrote in 1890 that the schools encourage Indians to abandon, what was that number again? I'm stark. Oh, good. All right. Um, to uh, abandon their paint, blankets, feathers, and savage customs, while the retention and exhibition of these is the chief attraction of the shows. But people like Buffalo Bill had their influence on the government as well. So even as people like Morgan were saying this, they were able to get permission to get the uh, Indians to leave the reservations and to perform. And as performers, they demonstrated a culture in the United States and Europe that the government was making every effort to suppress on the reservations. Buffalo Bill's Wild West and shows like it offered a third alternative to the two extremes of extinction or complete civilization by assimilation that was posed by Carl Schurz. The problem had been that civilization, as visualized by Schurz, the reformers, and the government, had merely offered that extermination of a different kind, essentially cultural assimilation, if you will, a kind of cultural genocide. Rather than assimilation, the Wild West offered accommodation. Through the device of show business, the Indians were able to represent themselves as themselves, not as unwilling replicants of the dominant culture. This representation happened in the arena and in the Indian villages, both of which functioned as more than just curiosities for the visitors. By creating village settings and encouraging the performing warriors to bring their families, the shows helped maintain the family unit and fostered the culture within, within which they had grown up. Even when the shows involved financial or other risks to the participants, they nevertheless provided an attractive alternative to staying on the reservations. This was one of the reasons why so many Lakotas showed up when Buffalo Bill was doing his recruiting for the show in Rushville. It was a clear choice that provided the opportunity and allowed their traditions to be maintained even if in a theatrical setting. The shows offered a different path than the one advocated by the performers and by the reformers, I'm sorry, and the government. From 1883, with the beginning of Buffalo Bill's Wild West, to the 1930s, the Lakota resisted their assimilation by participating in Wild West shows, circuses, and fairs. When they traveled to Europe, they were greeted with a respect they were often not shown in the United States. A large crowd, for example, greeted the Lakota, as you see here, in 1932 in Brussels, where they dressed the little mannequin piss statue. You all know who mannequin piss is? He's a little peeing boy that's there. You can sort of see in the background. Uh, this is a very traditional statue that's been there for years. It's a huge tourist attraction today. And when visiting dignitaries go to Brussels, frequently they'll dress mannequin piss in their ethnic costume. That's exactly what they did when the Lakota were there in 32. And today there is a special uh, museum of all the different costumes that were worn by mannequin piss over the years. And this is the Lakota. Uh, costume. It's, it's, it's worth a visit. <laughs> in a visit to Pine Ridge in 1933, John Collier, the commissioner newly appointed by President Franklin Roosevelt, stated that the Indian's heritage was as valuable as any other heritage in America, and he condemned the former practice of suppressing their customs. His efforts, supported by Roosevelt, amounted to a new deal for the American Indians, where they would be viewed and treated not just as a vanished people, in fact, not as a vanquished people, but as a valued part of American life and culture. This approach toward a more, uh, the more diverse tribal cultures across the country, as well as efforts to get more autonomy for the reservations was a marked change from previous policy. The government not only ceased its labors to discourage Indians from performing, but actually encouraged their culture. And so you could see at the Century of Progress in Chicago in 1934, this flyer advertising their dances. 
And in fact, the company that was behind this particular performance borrowed from the title. Uh, they were called the American Indian Villages and Ceremonials Company. They sponsored these dances, and their letterhead stated, the ceremonies of the Hopi, Navajo, Sioux, and Winnebago survive a century of progress, a very important change in attitude from the past. The following year, a delegation of Lakota traveled to Brussels to appear at the Exposition Universelle. The group included four former members of Buffalo Bill's Wild West who had performed for over 30 years. Some had journeyed to Europe several times. Luther Standing Bear's cousin, Daniel Blackhorn, had first been to Europe in 1902, went back again after a couple of other visits in 1935. Sam Lone Bear, who started with Buffalo Bill's Wild West in 1894, and again, he's the one that learned French and German, he was returning to Europe for the ninth time. When the bus Brussels Exposition ended in 1935, the Lakota returned to Pine Ridge, and with the approach of World War II, no more would go to Europe to perform. After World War II, everything changes. The public's enthusiasm for Wild West shows subsided, and instead you had the rise of the Western movies. Due to the reforms introduced by the uh, Roosevelt administration, the Lakota could practice their culture at home, so they didn't need Wild West shows. This helped contribute to the rise of the powwows that are so prominent throughout America today. That 50-year era of Lakota performance in Europe began in 1887 with the arrival of Buffalo Bill's Wild West in London and ended in 1935. In 2004, a time capsule from this era was discovered in Brussels. It was in the form of several trunks containing over 150 Lakota artifacts. Nine of the Lakota artifacts uh, were from earlier than 1935, including this breastplate that belonged to Red Shirt, who first traveled to Europe with Buffalo Bill in 1887, and then later in 1910 left this breastplate behind in Brussels. The remainder had been acquired from the Lakota delegation that was in Brussels in 1935. Both, they were both gifted to and purchased by a local butcher who was an Indian enthusiast. The artifacts in the collection, however, were jealously guarded by him and were rarely seen after 1935. When he died in 1980, the collection didn't really surface in 2004 when it was sold to a friend of mine, Francois Schladiuk. Schladiuk, who bought the trunks, not knowing their story, began researching the collection and discovered they were from the 1935 exposition. Over the ensuing years, his research unco uncovered photos of the artifacts being worn in 1935, and he was able to link them to specific performers. So here we see Charlie, little boy, wearing that shirt that we just saw. His research also brought him to Buffalo Bill's museum and grave, and so I had to say that, and led to a uh, friendship between us. In 2009, we exhibited some of the collection at the museum. One of the results of this, here's the brief commercial announcement. Oh, uh, over, uh, one of the results of this uh, friendship is Lakota performers in Europe. Did I go ahead here? Well, how about that? You're not going to get the commercial. Anyway, uh, I won't be able to show you that picture, but Lakota's uh, uh, performers in Europe, their culture and what they left behind has just been published by the University of Oklahoma Press. I'm pushing it right now because it's a BBCW gift shop, but most importantly, I am honored that it's part of the William F. Cody series on the history and culture of the American West, which is a collaboration between the press and the papers of William F. Cody, which is, we well know now, uh, the sponsor of this symposium. So uh, enough on that. Now, to this picture, the imprint of the Wild West in Europe remains. The Munich Cowboy Club was destroyed during World War II, rebuilt with the help of American servicemen after the war. Throughout Europe, even more Indian Wild West hobbyists sprung up than had existed even before the war. Last month, this is kind of fun if you see that picture, I discovered the True West magazine was available in stores throughout Norway, even up above the Arctic Circle and my wife's rural Norwegian relatives all knew about Buffalo Bill. In fact, today, Buffalo Bill is probably as well-known and maybe more well-known in Europe than in the United States, in part because of this legacy of his own as well as Lakota performance. 
Just as museum exhibits in the United States have focused on the cultures and arts of Europe, now there are arts in Europe of the distinctive cultures and arts of the United States. European mention, uh, excuse me, European attention to the American West and its people has moved beyond the Wild West shows to be much more thoughtful and profound. So we see this exhibit at the Medici's Pizzi Pitti Palace in Florence. The Pitti Palace in Florence of Lakota arts, American Indian arts, exhibited almost side by side with the European masters like Da Vinci and Raphael. There are many aspect to aspects to Buffalo Bill's legacy and we'll be learning about those throughout this week. Not the least is his impact on Europe's understanding of the American West and particularly of the American Indians. Thank you. <laughs>